Good morning and welcome to Berean Baptist Church for our main morning service and a warm Memorial Day weekend to you. We're so thankful for the United States of America, the country God's given us, and the freedoms God's given us. It is a gift from God. Not every country enjoys what we enjoy in the freedoms of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. And I want to take a moment, in just a moment, we'll stop after the next hymn, and we're going to ask all of those who are, have served in our country at some point in the past to stand. I realize that this is not Veterans Day. I realize this is Memorial Day. It's a day when we honor those who have fallen, who are, who are not here, who have given their lives for our freedoms. But we'd like to, by way of recognizing those who have served, pay tribute to those also who have, who have served and not come back. So again, let's go ahead and let's start with a word of prayer, and we'll go to our hymn book. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the privilege it is to be an American. But oh Lord, what a greater privilege it is. What a wonderful, what a wonderful position it is to have received Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and be a citizen of a better country. And have a reservation made in advance for heaven to have our sins washed away in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and know that we have eternal life here and now. And Father, I pray that if there's any this morning who are not saved, that don't know they're going to heaven, that they would get that settled this morning. And Lord, this could be their greatest day of freedom, their day of the new birth into your family. And Father, we ask that you'd bless the services. Help us as we lift you up in your son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You have your hymnals as we stand and turn to hymn number five. Hymn number five as we stand and sing, When Morning Gilds the Skies. Hymn number five. It's a very wonderful thing to be able to grow up in a country like this and to be able to have freedom of religion, to be able to attend the church of our choice and worship in freedom of conscience openly. It is a privilege that many do not take advantage of. And I'm glad you're here this morning. 
It's an honor to be able to serve the Lord and to worship him in the public congregation. The church is not an institution made by man. It was made by the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church. And to be able to be a part of a local church and a vital part of that church is a privilege. It is wonderful. I don't say that because I'm a pastor. I believe it's wonderful to be a part of anything God has made. Now, I want to just take a moment today, and I'm going to ask. I know that there may be some veterans that may feel a little bit, they have hard, some have hard memories. Some have memories of combat. Some have memories of difficult times in war. But I want to ask them if they, if you've served, I'm going to ask you if you would stand to your feet just so, by, so that we can recognize not just your service, but all those that did not come back. Would you stand if you were involved in any one of America's armed forces? Would you stand to your feet? Amen. Amen. I want to just take a moment and just say thank you to these. Thank you for your service. We believe that when a young person comes across someone who served in the United States military, they ought to thank them for their service. We want our children, we want our grandchildren to grow up looking at people who served in the military and saying, thank you so much yeah. for serving in the United States military. We want to give honor where honor's due. Yeah. Thank you. You may be seated. Behind every one of these men stands thousands, maybe tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands that did not come back. And we want to take a moment. I thought of Brother Searcy who served in Vietnam along many friends who did not come back. And I want to just take a moment and say that freedom costs. Freedom costs an awful price. And the freedom of our salvation costs an awful price. The wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus Christ so that it would not be poured out upon us. And I cannot just say that I'm thankful to be an American, though I am. I'm thankful to be a child of God, though I do not deserve it. Thankful that Jesus Christ would save me and save anyone who turns to him by faith and recognizes I'm a sinner deserving <laughs> death and hell, but he died my death. Thank you for dying for me. And I, want, I want you to know if you've not received Christ, today would be a great day to do so. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. I also want to take a few moments just to ask for uh, your prayer. Uh, Mrs. Laster, I, I misspoke. I, I miscommunicated something in Sunday school. Mrs. Laster is not doing well with an upper respiratory cough. It's Brother Laster's mother that has the bad back that's not doing well. And so she has five uh, bulging discs, and it's actually called canal stenosis. So if you'd pray for the Lasters, that would be a blessing. It's so good to have visitors with us today. We have a number of visitors, and among them are my Uncle Steve and Aunt Lucy and Uncle Mike and Aunt Linda. And uh, just a blessing, two of my dad's brothers and my dad's sisters here. So if you see anyone who acts like my dad, that's probably a brother. And, um, and I, they may be actually slipping out as soon as the service starts to sit in the back of dad's children's church because they've never heard. I don't know they've ever heard my dad teach. And so they're going to be probably in the back there just listening to their brother, Ken Lang. And so that'll be a blessing and um, just glad to have each of you here, really am. Well, one more thing. We uh, are not having orchestra practice today or choir practice. We're having choir practice next Sunday. And uh, then after the service tonight, so we're having, this is really the third day of our music conference. If you missed uh, Friday, Saturday services for our music conference. I would urge you to go online and pick those up and listen to them, download them. They have been very helpful. Today, you've already heard uh, Brother Ives. And Brother Alan Ives is with us for Sunday school, the main service, and tonight will be his last services, I think, with us. Maybe this coming Wednesday, I'm not sure. But um, he is going to be speaking this morning, and then tonight, um, I'm really looking forward to tonight's services and this morning. I believe God is going to work and, and help us in distinguishing and giving us biblical discernment in the music. 
especially important from today. Did you know that God has a say about almost everything in our lives? Do you know that God speaks? God speaks, and God speaks clearly. And did, w does it surprise you that God even speaks clearly about music? No, well, God speaks clearly. Uh, just, it's wonderful to have clear Bible teaching. It really is. So thank you for joining with us this morning. I'm going to go ahead and ask if Brother Randall will come up and lead us in our second hymn. As I said, tonight after the evening service, we're having the Sweet and Salty Fellowship. Hope you'll join us for that after the services. And thank you for the great, uh, we had a great time yesterday for a Memorial Day meal at the church at 5 o'clock. All right, Brother Randall. Let's stand once again, 201. Oh, magnify the Lord, 201. Excellent presentation on Wednesday night from Matthew Shelley. It was a slide presentation. I should slide. People don't even know what slides are anymore. It was a video presentation up here of God's working in his life in India. And he's going to be headed down, down to, let's see, Bolivia here shortly. Is that right? In just a couple weeks. So he'll be headed down there and uh, just seeking God's direction for his life. Already been to Bible college and looking at mis the mission field. Heidi James is back from Canada. So great to have her been on the mission field for a year there already can you believe it and uh roughly and um she's she's still serving the lord faithfully back for just a few weeks and headed back up let's go to the lord in prayer for the offering father again we're so thankful that every good and every perfect gift comes from above from the father of lights with whom there's no shadow of turning thank you for your faithfulness to us i pray that you'd help us to be faithful to you. Be reflections of you as your children. I pray the family likeness would be very real. May we not be hypocrites, but be real. That we would be honest men and women of integrity, living as children of light in a dark generation. Thank you for the privilege it is to be, we believe, as you said, in the last days. May we be the light and the salt this generation needs. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
And once again, 641, all that thrills my soul, 641. I just wanted to say one quick word, and that is there's something important about having men come and preach who have lived through certain things, and they can look back and say, I have seen. David said, I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. 
And that came from a man who went through the wilderness chased by a king, Saul, for many years. And yet he said, I've never seen God forsake. There's something about music that in our country in the 60s and 70s, there was such a transition, such a change for the worse, and it affected every area of American life. And I have someone who not only knows music well, you can tell that about Brother Ives and Brother Randall when you're around them, that they know music. You can hear it when he plays. He knows music. But it's something beyond just knowing music when someone has lived through a period of time and can look back and they can say, I saw what happened in our country. I don't not only lived it, I was involved in it. And God brought me out, took me out of the miry pit and set my feet upon a rock. There's something to be said about a testimony like that. And it helps to have Bible teachers and preachers. It helps me as a pastor that I can step down and I can say, okay, so I learned to play a tuba and a trumpet and a euphonium. A little. But that does not mean that I've had the years of experience that I can turn to. And Brother Ives has had pastors in the past challenge him on, yes, but do you know, how many scripture verses do you know about music? Do you know 10? Do you know 12? And he said, well, I did, but it scared me for a moment. And then he said, basically, his life became studying the scriptures to see what God's word said about music. It's not enough just to live through a bad time but to have a biblical perspective and a background of Bible study makes this kind of teaching, I believe, invaluable. So I'm thankful that Brother Alan Ives are here. He and his wife, Mrs. Ives, it's so good to have her as well. You've seen her up here playing a little bit, and that's a blessing. Um, and you've also heard John Randall. It was a blessing to hear Grandma and Grandpa playing alongside Philip in the trio. Wasn't that a blessing? And I think what a, what a blessing it is to have Brother Ives be able to teach what he's taught for over 40 years, but for the first time to have some of his grandchildren that he's able to pass these on in the room while he's teaching that. Now, Susan, you traveled with your folks in music, and you heard mom and your mom and dad teach these things for years. And now your children and your nephews and nieces are here today. And to me, that's very special. I'm glad to have the Ives with us. Would you come? I found that being in the ministry of music filled a home with good gospel music and what a difference it made. And. Uh, my wife even discovered that while we traveled, if the tone in the van was not very warm and distant, <laughs> I, mean, who, I don't know if that would have been my fault or whose it was, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, she found that if she hummed a, a gospel tune, it wouldn't be long before that the father would say, forgive me for being so crabby. And uh, <laughs> it changed the tone even when we traveled. And uh, we're together. But uh, this is a song of, about serving the Lord, and it's entitled To the Work, rather a march, and probably is there you can hire someone? this age, there's a whole lot of things that you can't trust, and <laughs> eyeballs are one of them. But with the Lord's help, to the work. <laughs> you don't have to retune it. Go ahead. To the work, to the work, we are servants of God. 
Let us follow the path that our master has trod. With the balm of his counsel, our strength to renew. Let us do with our might what our hands find to do. Toiling on, toiling on, toiling on, toiling on. Let us hold, let us watch, and labor till the master comes. To the word, to the word. Let the hungry be fed. To the fountain of life, let the weary be led. In the cross and its banner, our glory shall be. While we herald the tidings, salvation is free. Toiling on, toiling on, toiling on, toiling on. Let us hold, let us watch, and labor till the master comes. Do the work, do the work, in the strength of the Lord, and a robe and a crown shall our labor reward. When the home of the faithful our dwelling shall be, and we shout with the ransom, salvation is free. Toiling on, toiling on, toiling on, toiling on. Let us hold, let us watch, and labor till the master comes. And labor till the master comes. And Grandma from Tennessee. She wrote this song. We wanted to sing. Next, we're going to look in Hebrews chapter 4 and ask for opening word, Matthew 11 and Matthew 21. But uh, Mina Oglesby sang and wrote song. Maybe she still does. And this one, taken from the book of Jeremiah, when God sent Jeremiah down to the potter's house. And uh, wonderful thing there. Jeremiah said, then I went down to the potter's house in chapter 18. And behold, he wrought a work on the wheel. And the vessel that he made was marred in the hands of the potter. It doesn't say God marred the pottery. He put it in his hands and saw that it was marred. We need to understand that right. And then it says, so he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. That's part of the story of salvation, isn't it? God sees that we're marred with sin, he makes us, what did he say? Again, another vessel. He makes us a new creature. He makes us over again, not the way we might have wished or wanted or asked, but as it seemed good to the potter to make it. God does it for his honor and glory, and what he does for us is better than we could ask or think or wish or hope. We were rescued out of a, a, a life of darkness and into God's marvelous light, and we just sung and sung and sung and rejoiced in the Lord. And uh, as we sing, we think of the we think of the text as well, and the, it's just an enjoyable ministry. It gives 
even back to us, and God is very good there. Oh, what a wonderful thing to just be able to sing for the Savior. But this is called The Potter's Hands from Jeremiah 18 by Mina Oglesby. And just in case it bothers you, you know, why do people wear glasses? It's not really for looks, but they, they gave me artificial lenses and they focus at two to three feet so I can preach and read the Bible. But then I can't wear them for that purpose. That's the only time I take them off. <laughs> Otherwise, I even sleep with them so my dreams are in focus. But <laughs> This is the potter's hands before I say anything else foolish here. <clears throat> the hands of the potter from an old field of clay I was brought by the spirit to Jesus one day and the people gathered round him and each tried to say what the potter would make from this poor lump of clay just some clay and a potter plain old clay but the potter for his hands the wounded were tender and kind as they fashion a vessel of love. In the hands of the potter I was washed clean and then on life's wheel Jesus shaped me again and again. And the people passing near him could all hear him say, I must do what I will with this poor lump of clay. He's just clay, and I'm the potter, plain old clay. Oh, but the potter for my hands, the wounded are tender and kind as they fashion a vessel of love. In the hands of the potter, I was fashioned anew. But the Lord only knows what this vessel 
must do. I'm so glad when Jesus saved me, his grace let me say, thou canst do what thou wilt with this poor lump of clay. We're just clay. He's the ponder. Plain old play, oh, what the potter for his hands, the wounded are tender and kind as they fashion a vessel of Back then, when I played in the bars, couldn't know how quietly arrogant I was, how much better I thought I was than them because they were paying to come see me and hear me. All kinds of wickedness, things that people might never have known, but, but uh, what a wonderful change the Lord does make. It's amazing to ourselves, and if you know yourself and you're saved, you know what God did for you when he saved you is just beyond the ability to explain sometimes. The, the, the change is so wonderful, and we should never get over that. Every day we wake up, we're still the Lord. I woke up in a hospital one day. Let's turn to Hebrews 4.12. Woke up in the hospital, couldn't remember a thing. Couldn't remember a Bible verse, couldn't remember a song. Couldn't remember my family genealogy past my father and mother. And uh, that's all I ever knew anyway. Well, I just related you the whole, whole of everything I know. But um, when I finally realized where I was and that I had survived open heart surgery, the first thing that came to my mind was, I'm the Lord's. And then I remembered part of a verse, the Lord is my shepherd. And that calmed my fears and my confusion for the time. It was the only comfort I had uh, dis discovering that I was not in too good of a way. But Hebrews 4.12, Hebrews 4.12, the name of this message is two musical choices even a child can make. Even a child can make. And I think of, of what I found in the, the two passages in Matthew. That was the most astounding to me. That children can understand what music does. How it works. Maybe not in its entirety, but they know that it does work and they know how to work it. Children. Children. But Hebrews 4.12, let's all stand. And we'll read just that one verse together out loud. Wonderful verse about the Bible. We want to see it in action in Matthew 11 and Matthew 21. When we get there, uh, Hebrews 4.12, let's read it together. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We'll say a few things about it, but let's pray together first. Lord, we would ask thy help again to take the honor and glory to thyself and to impart great and helpful, practical, real wisdom to people from the, the Bible, from the word of God. And if there's someone in need of salvation, may they see that they need thee today. 
as their Savior, and may they put their trust in thee. So, Holy Spirit, work in our midst, work in our lives, work in the lives of every saint of God. Lord, we just seem to need that cleansing and re-cleansing and re-cleansing and returning always to the Word of God to be brought back to a right place where such faulty, faulty creatures, sinful creatures, and the Lord, we thank Thee for the help that comes from the Word of God and from Thy Holy Spirit. But help me deliver this message now and work in every life, every heart. Guide me through this. Help me to say those things that I need to say and omit those things I should not. And bless everyone that's here. Give them what they need for thy honor and glory and thy name's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated, please. I'm going to say just a little bit about this verse. It is about the scriptures. It is about the word of God. They are quick. They are living. And I won't take the time to tell stories of uh, that many people have given. They found just the word in the Bible that they needed at the time they needed it because... It's a living book. It's a book of God. It's powerful. We mentioned that already. Those of you that are saved, that are born again, you saw God not only save you, you were there when you trusted the Lord, of course, but you saw the change that he made in you that you could not make and would not probably have made either. The word of God is powerful. We saw that. I gave you, what, nine verses that weren't anything about music that convicted me completely about my life as a rock and roll musician. And I could not get any comfort until I got out of that band, out of that lifestyle. The Word of God is powerful. I'm glad for that. And sharper than any two-edged sword. Folks should never be offended by a preacher preaching. If he preaches the word of God, it's a two-edged sword. It does cut. It hurts, but it cuts like a surgeon's knife so that we can be cleansed of the dross, cleansed of, of the wickedness, cleansed of the evil. The word of God does that kind of work. Expect it to do something. And it says piercing. It's another painful Painful word there. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It really takes the, the word of God. It takes the Bible to show us the difference between soul and spirit. You put seven Baptist preachers in a room and talk about soul and spirit and you'll get seven different definitions of each one of those things. The joints and marrow is a little bit easier to describe. That's this body of flesh that we have that likes it somewhere between 69 and 71 degrees, uh, if you're from Wisconsin anyway. If you like it a little warmer, I don't know. But uh, that wants to sit in the hammock with lemonade and iced tea and let someone else mow the lawn, let someone else go to school, let somebody else go to work. I want to relax. That's the joints and marrow. It does what it wants to do. It does everything for its own comfort and for its own pleasure. And we're housed in a body like that. But the soul and the spirit, I'm going to give some simple definitions to so that I can preach the message and get somewhere. I have to keep it simple for me. And I often say this, if we want to... Look at the difference between soul and spirit. Our spirit is where we know we're a man. We have the spirit of a man. It's where we know things. It's where if we think about God, we are thinking about God. In our spirit, it's, it deals with our thought life. The words, Jesus said, that I speak unto you, they are spirit. They are life. And so the spirit deals with thoughts, ideas, words. If I say peas, asparagus, beans... Beets, rutabaga. Our spirit knows what that is, at least what some of them are. I'm still not sure what rutabaga is, all right? But our soul is that part of us that deals with feelings and emotions. In the spirit, we know what a vegetable is. In the soul, we react to it and go, mmm, or ugh. And so that's the difference, and I'm going to keep it simple that way. We house thoughts in the spirit, in the soul, that makes up what, 
what becomes our personality or our character. We have all of our likes and dislikes, the things that we love and the things that we hate. Emotions, feelings. And we're told that the Bible can sort that out. And it even, it even shows us the motive. Brother Randall is preaching on motive. It shows us the motive. That's why people don't like Bible preaching. It shows us when our motives are evil, when our purposes are evil, when our intents and when our leanings are not good. But let's go right away to Matthew chapter 11. And even the, the message is a simple message so that it's easy for me to preach. We have a bad choice in Matthew 11, and then we're going to go to a good choice in Matthew 21. That's good, isn't it? Bad choice, good choice. And obviously, that's one of those, you know, da things where you, you know, which choice should I take? You know, door A or door B? Well, we want to make the good choice and, and good choices in life. Matthew chapter 11, and we're going to see what's going on here in this chapter. I never heard anyone else preach on these verses. I call them obscure, obscure musical verses. And uh, they're just tucked away in the middle of some other things. Beginning in verse 16, Jesus is speaking to the people of his day, and really they're no different than the people of today. And this is what he says in verse 16, But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, We have piped unto you and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you and ye have not lamented. Now, it's not wrong to be a child. Believe it or not, I was one once too. But it's wrong to stay a child. We have to grow up, whether that's fortunate or unfortunate in our mind. Uh, we, th there comes a time when we say, I have to grow up. I have to mature. And these children in particular must have been well known in Jesus' day and age. And he said, you, you folks out there are like these children. It is like unto children sitting in the markets. Now there's something wrong with that. They're not supposed to be sitting in the markets. Their father and mother are selling their wares, selling their goods. They set up their little stand and they are are making their living. And as was, it was done, it used to be done anyway, the parents taught the children their trade. They ma made sure that their children were valuable and could earn a living. And these children are not supposed to be sitting, they're supposed to be working and helping their parents. But they're not doing that. They're idle, they're not doing any good, they're not learning what they're supposed to learn, it says they're calling unto their fellows. Oh, there's other children in the marketplaces. The younger I was, the more friends I had. And I, I liked being very social when I was younger. I liked finding other children my age. And these children are doing the same thing. So they're calling out to them. But notice what they're calling out in verse 17. They're saying two things. Number one, we have piped unto you and you have not danced. Oh, that's why they're sitting there. They're playing musical instruments. And I, I would say this right away. Some people just play music for fun. Some people play music for money. There's wrong motives with music, for sure. But these children are playing to get the attention of their friends. And they're upset a little bit. They said, we have piped unto you and you have not danced. That's the first appeal that they make to their friends. And the second one follows. But let's just talk about that for a moment. We have piped unto you and you have not danced. These children are pouting just a little bit because they tried to get their friends' attention by playing on their little flute. And they said, this is the way we play the flute and it makes people get up and dance. That's what I, I told you before amazed me about this scripture. Jesus let us know that children understand the power of music to move the human body. 
and in this particular case, to get up and dance. And, they're, and, and these flutists or whatever they're playing on their pipes are, are upset because their friends are not responding. Well, I can tell you why they weren't. It wasn't that they were bad flautists. I guess they, might, they say flutists again now today. But they were busy doing what they were supposed to do with their parents. That's why they weren't paying any attention. Their parents said, we got to teach you, you know, how to do what, what we do so you can make a living when you grow up. And the little pipers were upset. Come on, we, we played the little dance song for you, and you didn't dance. That's an appeal to the joints and the marrow, to the flesh. We play this song a certain way, and you're supposed to get up and dance. Probably a rather light or happy or frivolous song, whatever. But nevertheless, something to move the human body. The problem with this kind of thing, if, if I'm a musician, if you're a musician that plays just to stir up a, a reaction in other people's bodies, you become that kind of a person. You sort of think with your body. If we can, if we can use the word think there. There are people who listen to their flesh and follow their flesh. We call them flesh balls. That's the ter terminology that's given. If they want to do it, they do it. They used to say back in the 60s when the hippies were around, and I was too square to be a hippie, but, but uh, when the hippies were around, if it feels good, do it. That was their motto. That was the flesh ball's motto. They didn't care what the Bible said. If they wanted to do it, they did it, and they did. And it was a failed experiment. Their sexual revolution was an awful period of time, and how it ever could have been resurrected and people turned to it again, I don't know, but that's the way human nature is. Flesh balls, though. There was, there was a young girl who was a Baptist from Texas, I believe, Jessica Simpson, and I know she has a younger sister. Some people said, you gave me the wrong name. No, I'm talking about older sister, Jessica. And she got in a group. And her father was her producer and manager. And she got in this group, and she was a young virgin girl. We'll, we'll call her that. And she just wasn't sensual enough for the rest of the people in that particular market. They said, look, we can help you sell more records. But we have to step up. And they didn't use the word carnality, but we have to step up your dance moves, and we need to make them more sexy. We need to take some of your clothing off so you're wearing less and you look more sexy. We're going to have to spice up the lyrics of the songs that you sing and make them sexier. And then we will write articles about you in the newspapers and the magazines that will make you look like a very sexy person and that will make you more attractive and you'll sell more recordings. She went with it. Her father went with it. And they, they stepped up all of these things and if you had followed her in the tabloids and, and those papers, you know, at Walmart, you would have, would have seen what was happening. In the meantime, she got married and he was a young, handsome man but to her, her life was all about her. She did what she wanted to do. When people accent this joints and marrow kind of life, they become that kind of a person. That's why we have a name for them and call them flesh balls. And when you, when you play flesh ball music, you start to think that way. You start to live that way. You start to be that way. The longer I stayed in the rock and roll band, the more I became like a rock and roll person. Now, I was uh, what they, they didn't have a, a name for us, but they would have called me a nerd back then. I have big buck teeth, and I had these big glasses, and they were black, you know, Clark Kent. But I got in a rock and roll band, and it made me day by day, more and more rock and rollish. Did I understand all the lyrics? No. But as I began to understand them, I either had to accept them or I'd have to get out. 
And I discovered that I didn't necessarily agree with everything that they were singing. And then I became embarrassed. I don't want to sing that song. I know what it's about now. But I was a, I was a flesh ball, and that was the way I lived. I was pleasing myself, and I did what I wanted to do. But Jessica, Jessica married that young man, and their marriage fell apart because she wasn't focusing on anything spiritual. And she went to a Baptist church. I'm sure she heard something from the Bible. She was listed in just a few short years as the rich, the rich, the young, and the lonely. Miserable life. And like I said, last time I preached it somewhere, some young kids said, it's, their name is not Jessica, and I can't remember what her younger sister's name is. Jessica had already passed off the scene. Nobody knows who she is. I, I imagine her career is probably nearly over or over. You just, you don't see her. They're not promoting her anymore anyplace. Or maybe she wised up and got out. Or maybe she's dead. Don't really know. But these children said, we've piped unto you and you have not danced. Jessica built her whole life on music that she could dance to. Step up the choreography. More drums. More rhythm. More dancing. And it was miserable for her. But these children didn't give up so easily. They made a second appeal to their friends. What do they say in verse 17? We have mourned unto you. And ye have not lamented. They said, now come on. Come on. We sang the sad song, and you're supposed to cry and feel bad. And you know, you know what country western is like. Depending on what part of the country, you, 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 you sing these songs because you lost your horse, you lost your dog, you lost your truck, you lost your wallet, you lost your wife, you lost your job, you lost your mind. You have to play the record backwards to get it all back, you know, like the joke goes. But, but that's what that's all about. People living in misery, and they're sad, and because we have sorrow in our life somewhere, we go, oh, that's just, that song is like it's about me. And people get all wrapped up in it, and they will get attached to it. They're, they're not quite a flesh ball. We have to come up with another name for them. But you know what they're like? One day they go, whoa, I'm on top of the world. Everything is great. And then the next day it's go, oh, I can't wait for it to end. Everything's been bad. I can't stand it. I'm going to bed early. And then the next day they go, I got it. I can handle it. It's mine. Yep. And then the next day, it's, oh, no, this is horrible. And so they're up and they're down and they're up and they're down. Emotional yo-yos. That's what they are. They have a motto, too. It's not if it feels good, do it. It's, oh, people like it. Listen to your heart and follow your heart. Somebody quoted it at this conference already. Jeremiah knew the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. I cannot trust my heart. You cannot trust your heart. You can't trust your emotions and your feelings. And I'll tell you, if it hasn't happened yet, you'll get to a place. Life is so big. God made life so big that we really can't handle it on our own. And you'll get tipped upside down. You'll be overwhelmed. Even King David said the water's almost overwhelmed or whelmed over him. Almost sank. Life can get tough. It can be rough. But people want to go by their feelings. Well, I feel like wearing this today. Well, I feel like eating this today. Well, I, I don't like this person. I don't want to be their friend anymore. And they make, they make decisions just based on how they feel. I'll tell you what, you can wake up some morning and feel pretty bad. 
about everything. And if you try to trust your feelings, you, you'll not get anywhere with it. You'll not find the way out. But people are emotional yo-yos. They listen to their heart. They follow their heart. It, I just, I think of one lady that she needed a job. She went to a prayer meeting and, and uh, she said, I need a job. I can't find one. And, and so they prayed. And uh, the next day, day, she came back. Next time the church met, and she said, I got a job. I know we prayed, and I knew God would answer the prayer. And I was walking downtown, and the sign said, help wanted. And I went in and got the job. She was a waitress in a tavern. God didn't provide that. She just let her heart tell, I got my job. I got my money. I got it. I'm working, working in a tavern. But people follow their heart. I thought of another Baptist that was a good example. And I'm not picking on Jessica, and, and I'll name the name Glenn Campbell, probably one of the best. You know, I was fooling around, and the grandchildren saw me doing a little bit of the, the uh, William Tell Overture. Glenn Campbell could play the William Tell Overture 100 miles an hour. All over, all over the thing. He was a studio musician from the time he was young. But he sang all those tearjerker country western songs. You know, I love you, but I got a head down the track, baby. But you know what? When I, when I found out that I loved my wife and that Lord, the Lord wanted me to marry her, I didn't tell her I love you, but I'm, I'm heading out of town. If I head out of town, she's got to go with me. And if she heads out of town, I'm going with her. But those, those country western songs, are, they just make everybody cry. Because everybody, you know, had a lover, had a friend, and thought that, that this was the one, and then they broke up. They understand that sorrow, that sadness. When I was a teenager, and I'll, I'll say it again, I, I thought I could find the right one. I, I found all the wrong ones. And then I got saved, and I thought I had to help God find the right girl for me. And I picked all the wrong ones. Breaking hearts is bad to do. Especially when it's mine. <laughs> I found out, and I'm so serious about that, all I had to do, I, I said, Lord, I can't pick the right girl. Bring me my wife. Drop her in my lap. Teach me how to be the right kind of Christian. I'll spend my time in the Bible and going to church, and you just, just bring my wife to me. And he did. It sure was a lot simpler and a, a whole lot less broken hearts. <laughs> anyway, there's only two songs when it comes to country western. It's, it's, it's honey, I love you, but I've got to go. And the other one is, honey, I loved you, and you left me high and dry. Either he goes or she goes, and that's the whole story. And then they cry about it, and they sing, you know, sing, and they play that gulping guitar. I played one note last night. It went, one of those, oh, and they went, Grandpa. <laughs> but country western, I'll tell you, Glenn sang all those songs. He went through three or four wives, too. He lived what he sang. And I'll tell you something else. The lyrics they come up with, they're not, they're not great poets. They're not great people with huge imaginative minds. They just live through these horrible things and they write them down into a song. Who's that country western? That lady, she said, I lived my song. Stand by your man. Tammy, why not? Probably. But anyway, the people who play... The emotional yo-yo music end up becoming emotional yo-yos. And I'll make an admission, and I'll tell you a little bit more about Glenn. But, it, but anyway, that, that's what I became. I was up and down with the emotions, and I was listening to my flesh and following my flesh and being miserable all the while, especially after I got saved and God was trying to teach me some things. But... Glenn started out when he was a young man. He played on that old, old song way back, Tequila. He was one of the guitar players on that. 
recording. And you know, that's what got him. He never could beat the drinking. I, I read his autobiography, which he wrote before he died. That's the way to do it, you know. And at least read part of it. And he said he trusted Christ, but I, he just wasn't living for him. He said it right out in his book. And I believe him. I believe he knew the Lord. But anyway, he lived his life following his emotions. And it was, it was just destructive that way to him. Music will always affect the body. Whether it's a march or a dance, a lullaby that will put someone to sleep. Music will always affect the emotions. When, when I sing a good gospel song and I think about the words, often I move to tears. And uh, since my surgery, I've been over emotional about everything, I guess. But that is not the right aim for musicians. These little children said, we're going, we're going to make a a fleshly attack on our friends and get their attention. They couldn't do it. So they said, okay, we're going to go for their heart. We're going to go for their soul. We're going to go for their feelings. And they couldn't do that. And both of those are a wrong purpose. Well, that's what I was doing with the music. I wanted to sing the love songs to the girls and sweep them off their feet. And then the hard, fast, <laughs> noisy rockers to show the guys how tough I was. Fleshly and soulish, but the wrong aims for music. There can be a fleshly or a physical response. There can be an emotional response, but that's not where music is supposed to aim. These are wrong choices, two of them actually, wrapped up in one. And, and I have told people this before, and we'll look at the next two verses. If it did not affect how people thought of God, about God, I would say, who cares? The music's not an issue. But look at the very next two verses. Verse 18 first. Here's the prophet of God. Here's the man of God, John the Baptist. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he hath a devil. I read in another scripture that John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. And these people, these flesh balls and these emotional yo-yos are so twisted up and so mixed up that they're looking at what God did in filling a man with his spirit and saying he's got a devil. That's exactly the opposite of the kind of man John the Baptist was. They couldn't see the man of God in a right way with the kind of music and thinking that they have in their life. And even about Jesus himself, look at verse 19. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, Jesus is not, a friend of publicans and sinners. I guess that much we could admit to. Jesus was a friend to me and to you, if you know him. They could not see God, could not see the Lord Jesus as the Son of God. They went, well, he's just, he's just a, a drunk. And he's overeating besides. He just lives out there with all the sinners. And here's the last portion. We're going to leave them in their bad choice making decisions in their heart and in their flesh. He said, finally, but wisdom is justified of her children. Now, literally, that can be true. What I sow in my life, I may see in my children as they grow up and after they're grown up. But it's true spiritually, for sure. What Jesus was saying is, you can live by a lie right now if you want to. You can follow your heart if you want to. You can follow your flesh if you want to. But someday, later on, we'll see whether it was the truth or not. It will come out. 
Wisdom is justified of her children. What do you produce in your life following the philosophy you have? And you know, that settled a whole bunch of things for me. I had friends and relatives, and they disagreed about how we should raise our children. And I said, you know what? I have to do my best to study the Word of God and raise my children as I see the Lord tells me to, and you have to do the same. But if, if we don't match, I, I just need to live by the truth that I have because wisdom is justified of her children. I want things to turn out right down the road 10 years later, 20 years later, 40 years later, 50 years later. And so I want to live by the truth. I don't want to trust my heart because I know I can't. I don't want to trust my fleshly decisions. They don't work, and these things especially don't work in the crises that, that show up in life. And wisdom is justified of her children. I need to live by the truth, and that will come out later on too. So I just told my friends and relatives, here's what we're doing. I'm going by the Bible, and we know it's going to come out right. But these children are using music to manipulate other people. Well, let's take a look at the good choice. We're just going to leave them there in their misery. Matthew 21. Here's the good choice. Here's the good choice. And the multitudes that went before and that followed, verse 9 of Matthew 21, cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So here's a crowd of people, and they're all shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. And that was taken out of the Psalms. So first of all, they, they turned to the Scriptures for the lyrics of their music. There's a big crowd there, but nobody got up to dance. There's a big crowd there, but nobody's mourning because there's a sad song going on. Verse 10, And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? There was an emotional stir, stir about the Lord. And the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Now, everything that Jesus has done so far has been good. The crowd was all stirred up, and they began to sing psalms. And then when he came to the temple, he cleansed it of those money changers that weren't supposed to be there selling what they were selling. And then he found some blind folks and gave them sight, found some lame folks and made them strong enough to walk. That's all good. That's all good. Look at verse 15. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did. What kind of things did Jesus do? Wonderful things. He did and he does. He always does. They knew what Jesus did was wonderful that day. And the children, there they are. These are the children that made a right choice. The children crying in the temple, not, not weeping, they're crying out, singing, all right? And saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They're singing the scriptures. The chief priests were filled with exceeding great joy, right? Now, if you're following along, you know it wasn't like that. Can you imagine the religious leaders I don't care what the religion is. Jesus came doing good things, and they were sore displeased. I mean, they were chafed to the bone. What kind of religious leaders are those? You know, I need to tell you this. I was 19 when I heard the gospel from Jackie Clayton. We talked about it in Sunday school. And I started going to the Baptist church. 
because I'd gotten saved. And lo and behold, we were going verse by verse through the book of John. Verse by verse through the book of Revelation. Verse by verse, verse through the book of Genesis. Verse by verse through the book of Romans. And, and I said, boy, I, I never learned this in my Methodist church. Uh-uh. And I wasn't at the Methodist church anymore. I'd sung in two of their choirs. And the Methodist preacher finally came over. <laughs> First time ever. And he wanted to make sure that the Ives family was going to stay members of the, the Methodist church. And I told him what happened. I said, I, I trusted the Lord. And I got out of the rock band and I played. He well, well, praise God. He saved you and he changed you. And he said, well, that's an artificial life. I said, no, it wasn't artificial. It was very real. He never came over. He could have come over anytime. time. said, Mr. and Mrs. Ives, let's just pray for five minutes. We know your son is having a rough life out there. We know that he's troubled. He never did that. He came when he thought he was going to lose a church member or family. Five generations. And I, I told, I, he said, well, why are you going to the Baptist? I said, they study the Bible verse by verse. And I want to learn how to reach my friends and my neighbors and tell them how not to go to hell and tell them how they can trust Christ and go to heaven. Oh, he said, everyone's going to heaven. I said, what about the, the verse in Psalms that said, uh, it talks about this, all nations that forget God shall be cast into hell. The wicked in all nations that forget God shall be cast down. Oh, that's Old Testament. Yeah, yes, that's what I did. That's what I wanted to say. Yeah, and your point is? And I said, well, okay. How, how about in the book of Revelation? It talks about people being cast into the lake of fire. He said, oh, nobody can understand the book of Revelation. You write a book on Revelation, you'll make a million dollars. Nobody knows what that means. I just kept looking at my mother. That's why I'm going to the Baptist church and not to the Methodist church. He wasn't rejoicing. He was a lot like the chief priests and the scribes. The only thing he was concerned about was getting our family back into church. At the Methodist church. He didn't care what God had done in my life. And he finally walked out the door after denying all kinds of portions of the Bible and said, now, don't think I'm not your brother in Christ. I am. I found one of the other pastors. He was riding his Volkswagen near the university, and I, I opened up his car door and said hello to him. And he had a funny voice. He spoke like this. And he actually read scriptures in the Methodist church. He would do the scripture reading with a funny voice that he had. But anyway, uh, and I said, oh, Reverend Harvey. And I, I told him the same thing. I told him how I got saved. Here he's waiting at the stop sign to drive off somewhere. And, and uh, he, I said, can I ask you a question? I said, I know you read, you know, you read Bible in the Methodist church. Why, why didn't you tell me a, about salvation that I need, needed a Savior? And he said, well, we believe in quiet sharing. I said, okay, why didn't you quietly share it with me? He had no, well, maybe you weren't listening. I said, oh, no, I was listening. Their response, it just, they had no joy in seeing that I was delivered from hell and delivered from an awful life. And I just said, I, I'm leaving the Methodist church. I, there's no point in going back there. Nobody seems to care about what Jesus does. Well, let me finish the passage and close here. But it's, and uh, they were sore displeased. At least they had enough character. They came to Jesus, look at verse 16, and said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? They, can't, they couldn't stand all the children praising God. Ugh, just kids making all kinds of noise. They don't sing with great tone, not usually. But they sure, they sure have a heart for God. And so Jesus...
took the knife of the scriptures and stuck it in them. And, and Jesus said unto them, Yea, have ye never read? You chief priests, you scribes, haven't you been reading your Bible? Don't you read the scriptures? Don't you believe what the Bible says? Have ye never read? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. You know what it says in Psalm 8? Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies. Do you know what? Perfected praise is that simple, wonderful thing that a child can do, and so can a grown-up, but where we simply sing believing, not doubting. We simply rejoice because God said it, and we know it's true. And we rest in it. These little children were singing perfected praise. Hosanna to the son of David. They didn't go, hmm, is Jesus God? They just said he was. So they sang Hosanna with the rest of the crowd. And that's the last of what, what I need to say. God's perfected praise gives us strength. The joy that we get from it. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah knew it. A rejoicing people will always be strong Christians. You'll have strength in your, in your Christian life to stand. And your soul won't be sagging either. So Jesus gave them that scripture, and it says in verse 17, he left them and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. That was the end of that. But these children, let's look at what they did. They were in the crowd, and they were singing Hosanna, to the son of David. I don't know whether they ever saw Jesus before that day. But Hosanna is a big word. It's only this long, but it's a big word. It's an exclamation of adoration. They said, there's Jesus. He is the one we should adore. Hosanna means, oh, save me. Whatever they did before that day, they looked to Jesus, the son of David, and said, save me. Save me. Hosanna means, I pray thee, I beseech thee. They were praying unto him. I think of the men in Job's day that said, what prophet should we have if we pray unto him? Well, eternal, eternal gain. When you call on him for salvation, he gives you a free gift of salvation. And Hosanna means free me, set me free. They did not know John 8, 36. If the Son shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. But they sang, Son of David, set me free. Open to me, be wide to me, make room for me. They didn't know Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Hosanna means make me safe. They didn't sing safe in the arms of Jesus. And they didn't know John chapter 10 where it says we're kept in Jesus' hand and we're kept in the Father's hand and no man is able to pluck them out of my hand. No man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Hosanna means succor me, comfort me, aid me, relieve me. They knew it was Jesus they had to go to for anything that they needed. These children recognized their Messiah was Jesus, the son of David, the Savior. That's all part of their perfected praise. I thought about this obscure passage of these children singing in the temple, and I said, you know, that's what God showed me. I don't need to try and move people's bodies I don't need to try and move their heart. I need to take the scriptures and sing them so that the people hear the message of salvation in the Lord and are rescued and saved. Need to sing the Bible. That's the highest calling for a musician. Oh, you know, it doesn't take much to make people dance. It doesn't take much to make them cry. But oh, to, to sing a song whereby they can hear about the God who saves sinners. 
It's a completely different kind of life. I told preacher that when we were talking. I said, there's no higher calling than to st stand in a, in a pulpit in a congregation and lead people in singing the praises of God. I can't do a better thing with my life. I can't do a better thing with my voice. I can't do a better thing with my time. And then trusting always that preaching from the word of God will follow that music. And I said, Lord, put my music in front of good preaching. And I saw that that's what the Lord did for me. That's what he did for these children. They called on the Lord and said, Lord, save me. Then they began to sing so that others could hear. I'm 72 now, gave most of my life to it and not sorry for it at all. It's been a very joyful life. We use music to point others to the Lord Jesus Christ, to point them to the scriptures, to point them to the preaching of the scriptures. And as I said, there's no, no higher calling they chose heavenly music over the earthly and the sensual and, and the devilish. I think the two choices are, are easy to see, and I want to make sure I didn't forget anything. I could say a whole lot of things about how did they know the son of David. There were people all around them that talked about the coming Messiah, even those chief priests. And scribes, but when Jesus came, they didn't, they didn't want to trust him. They didn't want to follow him. They didn't want to receive him. But as I said, I did a long time ago. And uh, not sorry that I made a right choice. Let's, st let's stand to our feet. And I, I'll say this only that I've had some times in my life when I got turned totally upside down. I could not think straight. I did not believe God was doing anything for my good. But I had learned something, that I could trust the word of God. Not my feelings, not my fleshly desires. In order to think right when my life was upside down, I had to turn to the Lord and say, no matter how I feel, this book is right. And if I do what this book says, I'll, I'll come out right at the other end. I definitely learned and could not trust my flesh, could not trust my heart. But I can trust God and his word. And it holds us together when everything is flipped upside down. God is a wonderful, loving God. I would recommend that you trust the Lord if you never have. And if you're his already, that you follow him and let his word guide you every step. There's going to be a rough, rough road somewhere. And you just can't trust yourself. You have to trust the Lord and his word. He'll guide you through it. It's a light this book is a light unto our path and so forth. But um, with heads bowed and eyes closed, let me just ask you this the, this morning. How many are, are here and you're born again, children of God, and you say, I've made some poor choices in music. I've made some wrong choices in music. And I just want God to kind of clear up and clean up some things in my life. And I see I need to make the right choice. And I, I, want, I want prayer for that. I want help for that. Just slip up your hand and put it down. I'm struggling with some of those things. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm, I'm struggling with some things, and I want God to help me make the right choices. I'm, I'm right at a, maybe even at a crossroads about some things. Anyone else? Before we pray, let me, let me ask this. Is anybody here? And you've never, like those children who made the right choice, you've never said, Hosanna, Lord, save me.
You've never come to the Savior and received him, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And you say, that's me today. I don't, I've never made that choice like those children did. I don't know the joy that they had in singing Hosanna to the son of David. Anyone like that? I'm not sure if I died today, I'd go to heaven. Anyone like that? Just slip up your hand and put it back down. I see I need to get that settled. Well, let's pray, and then we'll, we'll close here. But dear Father, we thank thee for these scriptures that we read about the bodily, fleshly attack that music can be, the emotional attack it can be, and, and Lord, how wonderful it is when the music brings the word of God forth. That is what helps people, and we know it is. They need to hear Bible. Help our lives be like those children who made the right choice. And Lord, especially those that raise their hand, help them with the struggle. It's always such a struggle because of these bodies of flesh that we have. Lord, we're subject to vanity, and, and it's, I'm glad that we're also subject to hope. And then I would pray, Lord, if no one raised their hand and said they need to be saved, maybe everyone here knows thee already. But please, Lord, don't give them any rest or peace until they come to thee if they have not. If they cannot say, Hosanna, Lord Jesus, save me. Set me free. May they see they need to do that. And we'll thank thee and praise thee for working in their life too. Bless in these closing moments now, in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to let Pastor close as he sees fit and uh, would just invite you to, Christian, come to Jesus if you need to repair some things and if you're not sure you know the Lord or no, you don't for sure, come to the Savior today and be saved. Take a few minutes, let's bow our heads and close our eyes together. How many would just say very honestly, I remember the days when I was living very, well, I, my life changed whenever the music changed. When things were going good, I was happy. When things were going bad, I was down, led by emotions, up and down like a roller coaster, but I was not walking with God. How many would say, I remember those days? Would you slip a hand up in the air? Oh, I remember those days very plainly, very plainly being led by myself being led by my feelings, what I wanted. But isn't it wonderful when you surrender to God? Wonderful when God comes, you, you, he saves you and changes you. How many would say this? I'm saved now, but I still wrestle with my flesh and God spoke to me about being up and down from day to day as a Christian. And I want to be leaning on the Lord, not leaning to my own understanding. Would you slip a hand up in the air? I'm saved now but I still struggle with that up and down. Lord, help me to live the consistent, faithful reliance upon you from day to day. Many hands. Maybe you'd say, as was at the end with the passage with the, the children, you know what? I want to live my life singing Hosanna to the Son of David. I want the song of my life, the music of my life to be biblical, spiritual, not earthly and carnal. That's a decision even a, a young person can make. Lord, I want my music to be biblical and spiritual, not earthly and carnal. Would you slip a hand up in the air? The Lord spoke to my heart about that. Yes, that's wonderful. You know, it's so good when God speaks if we respond. It's so sad when God speaks and we don't. It's a heaviness when God moves in our hearts, but we do not move toward God. If God spoke into your heart today, maybe you're here and you'd say, you know what? Truth is, I know I need to be saved. Well, let me tell you, if that's the fact, then God loves you. God wants you to be saved even more than you want to be saved. And he's drawing you to himself today, and he's pleading with you. Maybe it's almost so clear you've almost like it's, you've heard his voice this morning saying, you need to be saved. Like the, the children in the market singing to Jesus but you're, maybe you're not a child, but you're an adult. And you'd say, but I'm not saved. Then won't you be saved today? You say, I don't even know how to. Let me tell you, you can do it one of two ways. 
you could come to the front right now when everyone else heads bowed, eyes closed. If you're a man, a man will step aside with you in the room and you can be saved this very hour, this very day, right now. And if you say, I can't do that, Pastor, meet with us afterwards. Pull me aside or someone and say, I want to be saved. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't leave this building without getting that nailed down for sure. That I'm going to heaven and I know it. It's too dangerous to live life on the precipice of hell. When any moment you could die and enter a Christless eternity. If the Lord spoke into your heart, you want to say, Lord, my music, may it be spiritual, not earthly. You say, Lord, I want to live faithfully, not up and down. If God's spoken, if he's moved in your heart, won't you respond to him now as the piano plays? That's all right. There's time. Would you take a moment with the Lord and draw aside? Say, Lord, I don't want to live the up and down emotional roller coaster life leaning on me. I want to lean on you. I want my music, Lord, to be spiritual and biblical, not earthly and sensual and carnal. It's a good decision. Adults and children can make that decision today. sing just the first verse of number 474 in your hymn books and we'll be dismissed. Take the world but give me Jesus, number 474. Sing.